Hey, what's up, guys? Joe McCall, Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. What's going on? Got a great guest on today. We're going to be talking about Airbnb and we're going to be talking about tiny homes. And if you are a fan of YouTube and you watch a lot of real estate investing videos, you've probably seen this guy on there. And uh, if you haven't yet, you're going to enjoy this interview. We're going to be talking about him. And he's one of the new hosts on the Bigger Pockets podcast, which is an amazing group. A podcast has been around a long, long time. And his name is Rob. Abasolo. I think I got it right. Yes, he's nodding. I got it right. Rob Abasolo. He's got a company called Rob Built. And uh, Rob Built, I think I got that right also. So anyway, um, super cool guy. I, just a couple weeks ago, I had within a span of a couple of days, at least three different people say, you got to interview this guy and get him on your podcast. He's got a great YouTube channel. He's the new one of the new hosts on the Bigger Pockets podcast. And so I said, yeah, man, cool. Let's get Rob on. I reached out to him. And so now he's one of my new good friends. And I'm going to be talking to him about what he's doing on YouTube, what he's doing with Airbnb, what he's doing with tiny houses. And you've got to check out his channel. If you go to YouTube and just do a search for Rob Built, R-O-B-U-I-L-T, you'll find his channel there. Check out his videos. And um, yeah, super cool. Now, this is, I'm doing this live right now on YouTube and Facebook, and we're going to be publishing it as an audio podcast. So I want to thank all of my YouTube watchers and Facebook listeners right now. Hi, if you're watching this live, please comment down below. And as we go through this interview, if you have any questions, type it in the comments and I'll be able to pop them up and ask Rob some of your questions because I'm sure you're going to have some. And if you're listening to this on the audio podcast, thanks for listening been doing this for a long, long time. I couldn't be here where I am today without my audio listeners. So I really love you guys. So if you're watching this on YouTube, again, tell us where you're from, type something in the comments down below and let us know if you have any questions in the chat or in the comments, we'd love to hear from you. All right. One more thing. This podcast is brought to you by the Joe McCall signature edition of Freedom Soft. And I have a webinar right here. If you go to hundredsofleads.com, hundredsofleads.com, I did this webinar with the founder co-founder of FreedomSoft, Rob Swanson. And we literally show you in this video how you can get hundreds of leads within a few minutes right from inside of FreedomSoft. This is where I do all of my house deals, my vacant land deals. And it's an amazing tool. And the Joe McCall signature edition of FreedomSoft has all my customizations in it, all my contracts, the workflow automations, the websites. It's all in there. So go to hundredsofleads.com. Just watch the video, see if you like it or not and then sign up. I promise you, you're going to like it. Should we bring Rob on? I think we should. How you doing, Rob? Hello, hello. Hey, man. Good. Are we just going to glaze over the fact that you said that the the, the person that you, the hundredsofleads.com co-founder or founder, his name is Ron Swanson, like the Ron Swanson from Parks Rob. and Rec? Oh, Rob Swanson. Oh, okay, man. I got all excited. I was going to say. What's up, man? Howdy, howdy, howdy. Well, it's an honor to uh, finally get to chat with you. Um, I've been watching your YouTube videos a little bit. Um, insanely high quality content. I, I just love the production value that you put behind your videos. So good for you. Congratulations. And you. uh, now you're the new, one of the new co-hosts of the Bigger Pockets podcast, a monstrous, successful podcast. Congratulations on that too, man. Thank you. That is a, <clears throat> man, it is, it is odd. I'm not going to lie. Cause that's definitely one of those like full circle moments where yeah. I, I really cut my teeth at the very beginning of my real estate career on bigger pockets. I remember one of my friends texted me yeah. and I said, dude, have you ever listened to bigger pockets? And I was like, no, what's that? He's like, I'm about to change your life. And I was like, all right, whatever, send it on over. What, and, uh, when was that? Oh man, that probably would have been like four years ago, something okay. like that. Maybe three, four years ago. I mean, I was like already getting started in the in the world of real estate in terms of getting my airbnb business up and running and like i think i had built my first tiny home but you know I, we all have big dreams in the real estate space and i was just I, I thought so so laser focused on the airbnb and tiny house stuff and bigger pockets was just so instrumental in opening my eyes and in, in, into the world of you know uh multifamily syndications fun self-storage what yeah, you yeah. name it right mobile home parks and it's just really weird because I I was a guest on the on the podcast probably about six to eight months ago. I can't really remember now. Yeah. And I felt like to me at that time, I was like, I've done it. I have I have performed at the Super Bowl of podcasts for my respective niche, right? Yeah. There are a few more podcasts out there, obviously, that would be like 
you know, really cool, like like this one. But oh, this, um, is, this is double the honor. <laughs> it's exactly, and, it, and and I feel it, and and so basically, I man, I remember I did that, and I I felt like I bombed it, man. I was like, this is. Uh, I had so much stuff planned that I was going to say, and I had all these little jokes. I was like, if they asked me about YouTube, I'm going to say this. If they asked me about Tiny House, I'm going to say this. And then it didn't go according to plan, right? And I was just bummed. And after it aired, just Tony Robinson, he's one of the co-hosts of the Rookie Podcast. He was like, dude, that was amazing. And like all these people were tagging me. And I was like, okay, maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought. And <laughs> so when they kind of called me and they asked me if I was interested in being the new co-host, I was like, um, uh, uh yes are you sure me why me i don't you know i just make goofy uh videos on the internet right and you know yeah. uh and it was all history from there so uh, or i guess the rest was history i nice. have a habit of making uh re recoining phrases that that already exist and changing them well are you doing just the audio podcast do you any do do you do any youtube videos for them as well so I will be, yeah. I mean, obviously I do the podcast and then the podcast lives on the YouTube channel, yeah. much like yours, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, I will be hopefully making content for them as well because that was, that was important to me when, when I was yeah. going into it. I was like, hey, you know, obviously I love podcasting. I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't. I mean, I really had no podcasting experience. I think I had done like two or three <laughs> podcasts before. That. I Honestly, I actually usually say no to podcasts just because, yeah, yeah I don't know. I, I, yeah. YouTube keeps me busy enough. Sure. And, uh, you know, when, when we were talking through everything, I was like, look, I'm a creator, so I would love to make YouTube content and, and TikTok and, and any any kind of content you got for me, I'm game for. And they're like, great. We were hoping you would say that. So over the course of the next year, I think you'll be seeing me pop up on their YouTube channel a little bit here and there. Good for you. All right, Rob. So people who don't know you, tell a little bit about your story. How'd you get started in real estate? And how long ago was that? So I got started in real estate about four and a half it's probably closer to five years at this point i mean it was like at the, yeah 2017 mm -hmm. because that's when i closed on my first like well i closed on my house in la i had just moved from kansas city my wife and i were super broke <laughs> we were poor in kansas city broke in la and in in kansas city our house was like one hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars, and we were like yeah. hey we're really broke and super into student loan debt why don't we just move to la that's a great idea, right? Well, where'd you, where'd you, I, I used to live in Kansas City. Where'd you live? Uh, on the Missouri side. Uh, okay. I lived in Waldo, like kind of right outside of Brook, Brookside. I lived in Grand. Brookside-ish. Okay. So I'm not, Grandview down by uh, in the south part of Missouri side of Kansas City. Oh, cool. Nice. I, hey, you know what? We loved it. I think yeah. we moved there not really expecting much. Uh, it was a job opportunity. I got a, an offer to write, you know, for, for Gatorade social media. And I was like, okay, because I'm a copywriter by trade. I was in advertising. And it was re it really grew on us in a way that we never expected. And when we left, we lived there for a solid three, four years. Wow. When we left, we were pretty bummed um, because we were like, this city is home. Uh, but, you know, we wanted to, I'm a big advocate of moving and trying something new. And we were like, let's do it. So we moved to LA. We uh, bought this, or we, we moved to a little apartment, which was like 660 square feet. And it was $1,850 a month. Wow. So a, a, a bit of a reduction from our 11 square, 1100 square foot house. That was like $1,000 a month. Yeah. And, you know, I think after about six months of living there, I just kind of came to the realization that I was tired of paying rent. You know, I was just like, you know, because I had already owned a home. So to go to paying rent and not building equity, I was a little annoyed. And so I was like, you know what? Let's buy a house. And my wife was like, can we afford it? I was like, Man, no way. We cannot afford a house. But I would rather be broke and own a house than comfortable and renting. And you know what? That That's just our personal thing, right? It, whatever is right for you is right for you. But it, sure. at that time, I was like, we got to do something else. So uh, naturally, we put an offer in in the most expensive city in the country. And we bought a house for $624,000, which was just over four times, I think, what we spent in Kansas City. Now, were you, and, did uh, you have a job? Is that why you moved yes. there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we, we made the decision to move there first. We just didn't move there until I locked up a job. I worked at like Vayner Media. So if you know Gary Vaynerchuk, yeah. was his ad, ad agency. And um, so we buy this house and we come to this realization that we have six months left on our apartment lease. And so I was like, well, we could either pay $6,000 to break it or whatever the, the thing is. We could let it ride out. Oh, no, it was $2,000 to break it, or we could just finish out the lease. 
And I was, we were, you know, we were getting a little broke. So I was like, how about this? I heard about this crazy little thing called Airbnb. Apparently you rent out your space to strangers and they pay you money to sleep and use your space. What's the worst thing that could go wrong? And my wife was like, oh boy, here's another one of your crazy ideas. Cause you know, uh, I'm just the guy with the crazy entrepreneurial spirit. I was like, no, I think this one's going to work. And so it did uh, spoiler alert. And we were making one to $2,000 a month doing that, <clears throat> renting that apartment on Airbnb. And then that house that we bought, the $624,000 house, the only reason we could afford that was because there was a little 250 square foot studio yeah. underneath the house. And I was like, hey, you know what? I've been doing research and I think this house, if we put it on Airbnb, we'll make two to $3,000 a month. Wow. And so she was like, are you sure? And I was like, nope, but you know, we'll figure it out. <laughs> and uh, of course, as soon as we listed it, two to $3,000 a month, our mortgage was $4,400. So, you know, on the high end of $3,000 a month, we were just crushing that mortgage. And then the one to $2,000 a month on our rental arbitrage deal, we weren't paying a mortgage anymore. And that's kind of when I realized, man, house hacking is great. I love subsidizing my mortgage. I love when other people pay my mortgage. How yeah. else can I do this? What if I had 10 of these? And so I told my wife, I was like, can I build a tiny house in the backyard? Because if we do, not only will we, we pay our mortgage, but we're going to actually make money. We're going to be in the black here. She was like, are you sure you can do this? And <laughs> obviously the common theme here is, no, I am never sure I can do this, <laughs> but I'm going to figure it out. And I was like, it's going to cost 40 grand. It'll take about a month. It's a tiny house. How, how long could it take or how, how hard could it be? Cut to 13 months later and $30,000 over budget. We built this little tiny house for wow. $72,000. And you know, I'm really glad I did. I, I ran out of money halfway through. I had to kick out the crew and say, sorry, I love you guys, but y'all, y'all failed me. You, you, you spent too much money. Not really. It was my fault for not really, you know, properly planning. And so they effectively built this tiny house. They built the box. It was like the stuff they stuck out it. They framed it. They drywalled it. But I, you know, I ran out of money and I was like, all right, I think I can finish everything. So I did the finish electrical, the finished plumbing. I put in the, the laminate flooring, the, the, the um what was it the cabinets the countertops yeah. Yeah. everything and i'm really glad that i did that because i learned the concepts behind building a house and all the in, in estimating and budgeting and, and budgeting and timelines and everything and so we came out of that you know a few bumps and bruises but man i'm so glad that i did because it led to the next tiny house that i built in joshua tree and that was the same exact tiny house same footprint but I had learned a few things. I wanted to optimize a few aspects of it. So were a few you, more bells and whistles. Were you already listening to Bigger Pockets at the time? Is that where you learned how to do this stuff? That was really kind of at the beginning of it because, okay. you know, it was also really surreal for my wife because, you know, on the way to building our tiny house in Joshua Tree, every weekend we would go. And every weekend I would listen to Bigger Pockets on the way to Joshua Tree from LA. It's a two and a half hour drive. Wow. And she was always like, you know, bored out of her mind. She's like, can we listen to something else? I'm like, no, I need to learn as much as I can about this stuff. So it was really kind of at the beginning uh, where okay. I was like getting into Bigger Pockets and learning all this stuff. And yeah, I built that house in, in Joshua Tree and uh, it went viral a few times on the internet. And, you know, it changed my life. Both of those tiny houses changed my life in a way I'd never expected. Were you already doing YouTube videos at the time? Not really. No, I didn't start YouTubing until really my tiny house in Joshua Tree was done. Um, that's when I actually started. I started YouTubing January of 2020, right before the pandemic. Um, really, it was December 23rd. We were all breaking at the office to, to, to go on holiday break. And I went to lunch with a few friends and it was December 23rd. So it was the last day before it was before Christmas Eve is not really relevant, but I like to, I like to really paint the picture for everybody, you know, and, uh, it helps. So yeah. I was sitting, I was sitting there at, at lunch. Um, and I remember someone brought up YouTube and they said, Oh yeah, man, this YouTube channel is great. And, and then I said, you know, I've always wanted to start a YouTube channel for about 10 years now. I've just wanted to do it. But I've always wanted to do kind of this uh, DIY, like a weird, quirky take on DIY. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You know, and then all of them effectively unanimously were just like in unison. They were just like, dude, you have to do that. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, yes, that sounds amazing. You're yeah. dude, do it. Go. You need to start that channel. And I was like, 
all right, I guess. And so I recorded my first video that week. And then on January 7th, 2020, I posted it and I got all, you know, I got like two views on it, whatever. Um, but that was the beginning of my channel. And then I posted another video and I didn't tell anybody that I had started this channel because I was like, yeah, it sucks. I don't want anyone to like, I don't want anyone to like overthink my stupid jokes. Right. Cause I was always like quirky from the very beginning. <laughs> and on the third video, Oh no, on that second video, I posted it to Reddit on, on the DIY subreddit. And I was like, Hey, I, I built this like cable stairway, you know, this is my YouTube channel. I started it. Here you go. And it got upvoted to the top page. It got like 3000 upvotes. It got like 12,000 views. Wow. And that was like, for me, that was a viral moment for me. Right. And that was when I was like, okay. And some good feedback and obviously some trolls, but overall people were really nice. And they were like, Hey, I think you're onto something, but maybe don't do this and this and this and this because it's a little cringy. And I was like, okay, thank you. You know? And um, I remember thinking like, okay, so Reddit didn't eat me alive. So I must be onto something. And I was like, I think it's time to tell the world, tell my friends. And I posted it and I said, okay, I've been holding this, you know, the secret for a while, <laughs> which is really like a month. And I was like, I started the, uh, the raw built channel, you know, I'm going to be documenting my journeys doing this and this and this and i changed my instagram handle from you know my handle that i had for like 10 years like rob a solo to rob built and that day i became rob built and yeah i don't know i was just like so scared you know because i was just like oh man people are gonna judge me but everybody was so yeah so 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 nice and i'm just I'm now I'm a little embarrassed that I was scared to be embarrassed, you know, because it, putting myself out there is really what paved the way for what would become, yeah. you know, uh, the, the raw built channel. I love how you've niched, you know, you're not the real estate guy. You're the tiny house Airbnb guy. Right. Um, so let's talk more about that. You, you started doing some tiny houses. I stayed in my first tiny house just a couple, three weeks ago in Florida. We were, I went to a conference and uh, the hotel rooms are just getting ridiculous now, by the way, and with, yeah. with everybody coming back to traveling and doing conferences um, and stuff like that. So the hotel room where I used to spend maybe 200 bucks a night was now four or $500 a night. And uh, so I went to Airbnb and I found somebody about five minutes from the hotel that had a tiny house in their backyard in Florida, right? Tampa area. And uh, I was a little nervous about that. I've seen it. I saw you talk about tiny houses on your YouTube channel. So I thought, well, let's give it a shot. And I stayed there. It was actually really nice. It was only $99 a night. And, nice. um, but it was brand new, had a little tiny kitchen in there, its own bathroom, shower, little living room and a bed. Very comfortable. Great experience. I loved it. Um, so let's talk about your journey into kind of this. You, 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 you built a tiny house in joshua tree was it profitable mm -hmm. did you make money and then how did you grow from there yeah so it was incredibly profitable so you know i built my tiny house in la for seventy two thousand dollars, and i put it on airbnb right at the beginning of the pen like right before the pandemic happened and i was going to be grossing probably three to four thousand dollars a month on it now my note on that you know after i had paid down all my personal you know, um, like I had a personal loan on it to help me finish it and get it through the, the finish line. My, my real, my expenses, I think max, and I'm talking max was like 500 bucks, maybe 600 for that place. So I was going to be cash flowing, yeah. you know, about $3,000 every single month on that tiny house pandemic hits. And I kind of saw this need. A lot of people were turning away travel nurses and, you know, we were scared, right? Like we don't really know what the yeah. pandemic was going to be. And so a lot of people, a lot of Airbnb hosts were like, no, I don't want you in my place kind of thing. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I think this is like our opportunity as Airbnb hosts. Cause I mean, Airbnbs get a bad rap, just like literally every uh, aspect of real estate. And, um, well, especially in and, California, especially in California for sure. And for me, I was like, okay, so I really, really wanted to, to kind of start hosting to travel nurses. And I did. And, you know, that stayed pretty consistently booked throughout the entire pandemic. It's what, what I like to call a, a midterm stay. So it's not quite uh, it's a, a short term stay is zero to 28 days. A midterm stay is longer than that. But the difference between midterm and long term is a long term stay is typically going to be a 12 month lease. 
Whereas a midterm stay, you know, they, they kind of check out after one to two, three months. So I was hosting travel nurses there. Okay. And I think I was booking, I, I gave them a really deep discount at like 2,200 bucks a month. So I was still making, you know, pretty good money on it. But now, uh, since the dust has settled a bit, I now keep it at a midterm because it's just really easy to do. And I charge now about $2,800 a month on it. Okay. My expenses on that are now really low, like two, 300 bucks a month because wow. I refinanced it into my note and everything like that. So now I just, yeah, I cash flow probably about $2,500 on the LA property that cost me $72,000 to build. So that's like awesome, right? Phenomenal. Um, then I built my tiny house in Joshua Tree, California. I spent a lot more on that one. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do it myself. I'm just going to hire a pro. It should not be that much. You know, I can I can handle the expense. And it cost me $165,000 to build that one. Does that include and the land? It included the land. The land was $12,500. How did now, you find the lot to build? Oh, just the MLS. You know, oh, really? I just... This, look, back back then, like back then as if it was so far... It was like three years ago, man. But at that time... That $12,500 was like, that was it, right? And then it slowly started going up as YouTubers opened their big fat mouths and started promoting how awesome Joshua Tree was. Uh, so a little bit of my, I shot myself in the foot there. But like, I'll say that a piece of land in that neighborhood now will probably cost you about 50, 60. Wow. And I just put an offer on land with, with a friend for 100K and that piece of land would have cost $50,000 a year ago. Wow. Um you know, so if, if you know any good uh, land acquisition courses or programs out there, please let me know. I will. I'll let you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, so okay. So I built that. That's where they are. I know. I know. And that's, I need to, I, I plan on getting into that, you know, now that I am the Bigger Pockets co host. I do want to really just sharpen my skills in many arenas so that I have a little bit more perspective on, you know, helping people save money and, and start their sure. business and everything. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, we all got to start somewhere, Joe. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I built this tiny house in Joshua Tree, 165, $12,500 was the land. Uh, and yeah, I, I launched that in the first year of launching that. I grossed $83,000. Holy cow. My note, like my expenses on that every single month came out to, because I did a cash out and got all my money back, which is awesome. My note on that, I believe, is. 900 bucks and my expenses run around 1200 bucks, something like that. So my profit at the end of the year, after all expenses and property taxes, insurance, all that stuff, $57,000. Good for you. Excellent. That's awesome. Everybody give them a round of applause. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> now are you doing um, short term Airbnb on the tiny house? Or are you doing month to month or are you doing the more of the midterm thing? On those. No, on, on the one in Joshua Tree is just straight up short term. So the, the majority of those bookings are one to three nights. It's pretty rare for it to be more than that. Mostly because people will probably have a little bit more foresight with like, you know, a lot of people want to live in a tiny house, but it's not really practical practical because it is a little it is a little annoying after a while, like if sure. you're not ready for it. And so two, three days is enough to really live out that dream in a tiny house on Airbnb. Love it. And then get out of there before you're like, oh man, I don't want this, right? So it's enough to kind of carry out yeah. this this you know fantasy land of, oh, I'm gonna sell everything and and live tiny. It's enough to live that out, but you know it's not enough to make you like hate the concept necessarily. So let's talk about why Joshua Tree. I've I've maybe driven through there before, but is it mm -hmm. is it close to some national parks? Is it in a forest? Do you have neighbors? Did you you know how big is the lot that you built it on? Definitely. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely, um, in, so Joshua tree is a city and then there's Joshua tree national park, which is connected to the city. Um, I built this lot. Um, so you can go secluded if you want to in Joshua tree. It was just a neighborhood for me. The reason I chose Joshua tree was because I built this house in Los Angeles, this tiny house, and it's just not practical to do that. The only way you can do that in LA is via an ADU an accessory dwelling unit. And I didn't have that option because I didn't have money to buy another house in LA. So I was like, okay, where can I build a tiny house? And I had heard about Joshua Tree. It was already getting cool, but it wasn't like what it is right now, right? And this was like really at the at the beginning of the 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 explosion, I think, um, where I had heard that this is where a lot of artists and musicians were going. And I was like, okay, 
um, let's do it. You know, I, I, it's two and a half hours away. I looked at Redfin at the time and yeah, stuff was going for like 12 to $20,000. And I was like, mm, I mean, it's close enough for me to manage. It's in my backyard. It's probably the labor is probably going to be cheaper because it's in a desert and it's not in LA. So I kind of just took a big swing, right? I wasn't really sure that it was, I, I didn't know it was going to become what it, what it became, but I had a relatively good idea because I got so much good reception really about my ADU in my backyard. Like it's the first time I it's like, this was before the raw built channel. And I already had felt like, like the, the talk of the town because all my neighbors would like, like I had never met <laughs> hundreds of my neighbors and they would stop me and they would just talk to me about the house and they would ask me questions. It was very flattering at first. And then like, then I had to start closing like my garage door because if I was ever like woodworking or whatever, they would come and like, stand stand next to me as i was like mitering my boards and i had to be like yeah hey, what's up and they're like i want no to way. talk to you about your tiny house you know so i knew people liked it i knew people were gravitating towards the design so i was like i think if i just do this again but better the only option is to succeed right and that's exactly what happened i mean i, I built it i would go every single weekend people would very shamelessly just drive next to the house like super slowly like at two miles an hour just drive right in front of it and look at the house and take photos and take photos of me and then just drive off. And I'm always like, I'm right here. I'm here. This is awkward. Wow. I just want you to know that. Um, so yeah, I just chose Joshua tree for that reason. It was affordable. So were there, were there people like, already like, doing tiny houses in Joshua tree when you started doing it? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, not really. Uh, I think around that time there were people that were doing tiny houses on wheels um, that's, that's kind of the, the beginning of that tiny house movement. No one had really done a tiny house on a fixed foundation, certainly not a two story tiny house. And I did a two story tiny house cause I had never seen one. And I was like, well, I think that this would certainly separate me from, yeah. from the competition. There were definitely some tiny houses on wheels and airstreams and stuff like that. There's also like tiny homestead cabins that people would market as a tiny house, even though it's not a true tiny house for me. A tiny house isn't just a house that's small, right? That 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 seems to be the perception. Like people will go and buy a house and it's got like a little 300 square foot shack in the back and they're like tiny house. And it's like, well, not really. It wasn't designed to be a tiny house. It's sure. just, it just happens to be tiny. For me, I was really trying to design a house that was like a miniature house. Like you walk in and you're like, whoa this is like a legitimate house. It's just so much smaller than a typical house, you know, yeah. especially with it being two stories. So there was a lot of code that I had to, you know, I, there wasn't tiny house code, right? I had to ab abide by the international residential and building code. The stairs had to be 36 inches wide. There were just so many aspects that were sure. very difficult to design around, but I was the first person to do that. Uh, someone else might've done it before me, but you know, I, I've got so, the YouTube channel, so I can say I did. I was the first. <laughs> in in Joshua Tree, though, is it? Did you buy a vacant lot in a subdivision, or was it kind of secluded? It was in a subdivision, and the lot was ten thousand square feet. Okay. I'm looking at Airbnb right now, mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of little. Uh, I did Joshua Tree, two guests, and um, I don't know how many there are, but some of these are just incredible. They're really beautiful. And some of them seem like, at least from the pictures, just real quickly as I'm looking at it, seem like they're kind of, you know, I've got beautiful scenery views mm -hmm. of the mountains. Um, they're kind of secluded a little bit. Um, is that what somebody is looking for, is looking for when they're looking for uh, a tiny house in a place like Joshua Tree? Yes and no. It really depends. I think a lot of people get in their head about this, you know, because I, I used to, I, I had a consultation business back in the day. I shut that down. But um, a lot of people were like, well, do they want the seclusion or do they want the views or this and that? So there's kind of two sets of audiences out there, I think. Yeah. Audience one, seclusion. They want to be in nature. They probably want to take shrooms with their friends <laughs> like at night. Uh, they just want to be away from the hustle and bustle. They may not even ever visit the national park. I mean, I've been to Joshua Tree on many trips with friends and I did not visit the national park. Oh. So... That's kind of subset one. Subset two are people that want to visit the national park and they're all about the location, right? They don't necessarily care about the seclusion. In fact, they might be scared of the seclusion. Yeah. It, a lot of people like, you know, when you're in Joshua tree, 
you're driving down a dirt road for 18 minutes and it's taking you to some random little house and in, in a neighborhood like or not really in a neighborhood but like in the seclusion it's kind of creepy it can be you yeah. know yeah. a lot of people don't want that um so a lot of people are just looking for location 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 my house is less than 10 minutes away from the national park so i think it's really a lot of early risers that are hey we want to wake up early go to the national park you know, be super close, not worrying about having to drive there because there can be traffic sometimes. We want to come home and stay in our refuge in our little tiny house, clean up, put our heads down, you know? So obviously th those are two very general audience subsets, but it, it just depends. So I guess what I'm saying is what you advertise is what people are looking for, right? Yeah, yeah. People are going to choose you based on the listing that you create. You know, it doesn't matter if it's seclusion. It doesn't matter if it's in a neighborhood. What matters is that the expectations were set in the marketing of the listing. Yeah. And guys, I'm, I know a lot of you are having questions. What do these houses look like? How do you build them? I'm telling you, you got to go check out Rob's channel on YouTube, Rob Built. Just go to YouTube, do a search for Rob Built, but it's one word, R-O-B-U-I-L-T. Right. And he's got a lot of videos where he actually walks through these houses and explains. I love your honesty, Rob. You talk a lot about like, um, here, this video, the harsh reality about prefab homes and why oh, I don't man, ever that, buy that, them. <laughs> yeah, that um, one, that one is, <laughs> that's one of my top performing videos and it makes a lot of people angry. A lot of people, the source of my hate on my channel comes from that video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those were, I sorted that by most popular. So maybe I should do the newest. Um, you talk about a, a, a mid modern century, a frame the downsides of managing an Airbnb, why I stopped buying Airbnbs. What was that about? Talk about that. Yeah. So, okay. So for me, I've, I've evolved past being just an Airbnb operator, right? Like that's what I started at. Uh -huh. And then I became a YouTuber and then that became my platform. And then, you know, I started my educational products and in, in, in courses and everything like that, coaching programs. And now I'm the co-host of the Bigger Pockets web, uh, uh, co-host of the Bigger Pockets real estate show. And then I've got like two or three companies that I'm launching. You know, one's going to be a service product in the Airbnb space. Another one is going to be a consultancy of sorts. So I say all that to say, I don't have time to buy the same level of Airbnbs that I used to, but that doesn't mean that I'm not buying Airbnbs anymore. What that video is about is knowing how to scale and when to scale. And so for me, someone in my position with the amount of time that I have, the limited amount of time that I have, I can't go out and acquire 10, $300,000 properties anymore. That was the dream for a long time. Hey, if I could just get to 40 Airbnbs, 50 Airbnbs. But what I can do is go and buy one $3 million property. And that's what I've done. Like I'm buying a $3.25 million house in Arizona right now. Come on. And the cash flow and the profits and the revenue are going to be the same as if I just went and bought, you know, three $1 million houses now or 10, $300,000 houses, except the difference is it's way less work. You know, it's a lot more work to manage 10 Airbnbs than it is one. So that video, a lot of people and a lot of a lot of my students were they were just like, wait, what? You're quitting? I'm like, no, no. The idea is I'm just moving away from the smaller purchases because I simply can't do it anymore. And I think that that really is what every Airbnb and real estate operator should be doing, right? Like you oh, yeah. can do, you can only do so many burrs before you're tapped out, before you have to really hire teams. And then hiring teams and managing those teams becomes a job and becomes a, a whole effort of conserving your time. So naturally, most real estate investors try to figure out how to scale. And this is why you see a lot of people going out and buying syndications, right? Like they're joining syndications, starting funds, buying 400 unit apartment complexes, buying hotels. Yeah. You know, I think for me, that idea was just kind of, you know, a lot of people are like, no, please don't stop buying. I'm like, no, no, just I want you to, to click so that you can understand my scaling strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're getting a lot of questions here and um, I'm going to be looking at them here. I'm going to pop them up um, in just a second, Rob. But talk a little bit about your current inventory and we're going to wrap this up here in just a few minutes. I apologize for starting late. Now we're going to go over, but um, talk, what, what kind of inventory do you own now? How many Airbnbs do you own that you're renting out and managing? 
So at this exact moment, I owned 14 Airbnbs all across the country. Uh, this would be in California, Arizona, Texas, Tennessee, West Virginia, Virginia, Wisconsin, all spread out, out everywhere. Um, I've been to half of them, <laughs> but you know, I aspire to go to all my Airbnbs one day. I'm really big into, yeah, remotely setting up and remotely managing. I think it's really possible. Um, but that was also part of that video that I'm talking about, though, why I stopped buying Airbnbs, because I had a really, you know, I had a really good year financially last year, and I could have bought a lot more Airbnbs, but I didn't. And it seemed like I, I wasn't. But what I've had to do is stop buying Airbnbs, even the luxury ones. I'm going to be buying those, but I've stopped doing that so that I could focus on really big development projects. And so what that means is I'm actually going to be raising a fund in Joshua Tree. And I'm going to be building 20 houses out there with Tony Robinson. He's my partner on, on the fund. It's for accredited investors only. Um, it's a 506C fund. And we're going to be basically be building 10 regular size houses, five small homes, and then five tiny homes. And so that would, you know, obviously a lot of time goes into that, but it's still, you know, it stops me from being able to buy more Airbnbs. Oh, but yeah. if I can just tough it out for like one, two years, it's going to add 20 doors to the portfolio. Yeah. Um, I'm also building a tiny house village in Tennessee. I've been working on the permits on that for <laughs> the better part of a year, unfortunately. Uh, but that's okay. We're, we're getting closer every single day. So I'm going to be building 10 glamping wow. treehouse domes out in Tennessee. I'm hoping to build five, uh, well, no, I guess six tiny a frames in Virginia. There's a little, there's some opposition there from, from the neighboring from the neighbors, they look me up and they're like, we don't want this guy here, you know? So wow. I'm working on trying to get the conditional use permit there. And then the really big project that I'm working on right now is trying to get 60 tents set up in Arizona. Uh, so I'm working through the conditional use permit of getting a full on glamp site operational. And, you know, when you add all that up, yes, I technically stopped buying Airbnbs, but in one to two years time, I'll now own an extra hundred Airbnbs. So it's all for good reason. Nice, nice. Got some questions here from guests. Hit it. Um, Lisa, by the way, is here. What's up, Lisa? Thanks for taking the time to do this. Nice hat, by the way, Joe. Lisa's a huge baseball fan. And the Cardinals won yesterday, in case anybody cares. Nine to nothing. They beat our uh, Pirates. All right, Sam. Good question here. Row built. Rob built, sorry. Question, if you were to look um, for vacant land that you would then uh, turn or use for glamping and or a STR, I'm not sure what STR is. Short-term Single, rental. Short-term rental, sorry. What would you look for in that land? Location, size, acreage, et cetera. Good question. You know, I think there's a lot of different things here. Uh, you know, when you're looking for land, I don't think you necessarily have to hit like all the bullet points. I, I think... It's kind of like a weighted system. You give yourself 10 check marks and, you know, like 10 criteria, right? Uh, price, size, view, location, seclusion, uh, topography, wildlife, whatever, right? And you make your criteria of 10 different things. And at this point in this market, you try to hit six out of the 10. You're never going to hit 10 out of the 10. So, Really, I mean, if I'm going to buy land for glamping, ideally, I want something that gives me a little bit of room to grow. There are a lot of people out there that will go and buy one acre and, you know, try to put a couple of tents on there. I think you can do that. I think for me, when I was first getting started, all of our tents were about a football field away from each other. No one really ever complained about that. So, yeah, seclusion is great. But Again, like I said, when you're driving down a dirt road for 20 minutes, it can be a little creepy. So a lot of people are very relieved to see that they have neighbor, like neighboring glamping yeah. tents nearby. So I would say when you're looking for glamping land, find something that gives you a little bit of room to grow. Because if you just buy one acre and you set up all your systems and you automate it and you have a property manager or a cleaner or whatever, there's only so much you can do on one acre. So I would try to find something that allows you the ability to expand if that's something that you ever want to do. I would definitely also look for land that is zoned agricultural is always going to be the most flexible. Um, but really this is kind of the sticking point with glamping, right? You know, you can go out and put a tent for sure. It may not meet 
county rules. It may not meet the ordinances. You'll have, you may have to get a permit. It can be kind of tough, right? And a lot of people will go out and do this without a permit and, you know, they fly under the radar for a long time. It could not necessarily be a big deal these days. That's how, that's how I started out. But these days, you know, I'm working more towards getting everything permitted and having a legitimate business operation because if you go out and you buy a piece of land and you put a tent there, let's say you put two tents and those tents are grossing $40,000 a year, it's 80K, most of that's going to be profit. You can't really sell that as a business. You can't go to an investor and be like, hey, this makes $80,000. How about you pay me uh, a one multiple on this, right? Yeah. And they're not going to buy that for you from you for 80 grand because it's not worth anything because it's not it's not a legitimate sustainable business, especially from the county perspective. So for me, I'm always looking towards how can I get that conditional use permit? How can I get permitted so that if I go through that extra work, then at that point, if it is permitted and it is cash flowing and I've got 60 units in Arizona, like I'm telling you about, and they're cash flowing, then I can go to an investor and say, Hey, I would like $10 million for this and they'll buy it. Yeah. But if it was not permitted, they wouldn't. Right. Yeah. So I think you want to find something that has at the at a very minimum a county that has very loose restrictions and regulations or none there are a couple counties out there that have like no building code at all and they they laugh if you if you like say hey i want to put a tent they're like okay go ahead yeah. uh yeah you know, we got bigger fish to fry so that's kind of my 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 two pieces is like get something that allows you to expand get something in an area that either allows for a permit is flexible um you know has a, a way forward for you to to get a permit. I think that would be it. That, that would be just the easiest way for you to protect your business. Uh, for an SCR, I think location, 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 personally, I would rather have an amazing location over seclusion all day. Okay, good. Question from Scott here. How are you handling plumbing, toilets, running water, electricity on a tiny house? Basically utilities. How are you, uh, are you, are you only buying land that already has utilities on it? Most of the time, yeah. So when you're building a tiny house on a fixed foundation, I got that fully permitted. The only way that I could get that fully permitted is if I'm abiding by yeah. basic code, right? So I have to have electricity. I have to have sewage. I have to have water. So my piece of land was along the water line. In Joshua Tree, a lot of pieces of land aren't, and you could easily spend twenty to $100,000 getting water there or even electricity. So I'm always looking for land that has an electrical pole on it or nearby. Every new electrical pole that you need to erect or like connect from can cost you anywhere from five to $10,000. Wow. So I'm always looking for land where I can see it like on the corner of the property. And then there is no no sewer line out in Joshua Tree. There is a sewer line in Yucca Valley, but you know we basically just have to do septic Septic seems a lot scarier than it is sometimes. Like, you know, my septic was like 35, 4,500 bucks. Okay. Cool. All right, Rob, we got to wrap this up. Um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about your mastermind. You've got a mastermind of guys <clears throat> and ladies that are doing something similar to what you're doing. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. I've got um, Host Camp. Host Camp is my 12 month mentorship program. It basically, if you want to just learn the blueprint for starting an Airbnb business from the ground up, um, it's 80 plus videos. It's a video curriculum that you have lifetime access to. And then it's 12 months of mentorship, which is effectively like a once a month we go live, we do a group coaching call and I teach a little bit. I'll do some Q and a, and then I'll do hot seats where I let people actually like raise their hands, ask me a question. And then I sort of shake them up, interrogate them, slap them around, criticize their business and make them better. Very Dave Ramsey style, but very, very <laughs> positive in the end. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you want to learn more about that, very easy to remember. You can go to hostcamp.com and you can, you know, book a call with my team and see if it's the right fit for you. Hostcamp.com. Hostcamp.com. Is that banner correct? There it is. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, if you're interested in, in you know, chatting, chatting with me or my team, we'll see if you, you fit. But yeah, it's been really great. I've got, uh, man, it's a really big community. At this point, I've been doing it for less than a year and I've got like eight, 900 students. And I'm finally... It's a newer program, but I'm finally starting to understand, like I'm starting to, to see the effects of people actually starting their Airbnbs. People are posting screenshots of how much they're making. People are doing way cooler stuff than me, like way cooler. So it's very gratifying. Nice. Hostcamp.com. I just capitalized both words there. And um, check out Rob's channel at robbuilt.com. Go to R-O-B-U-I-L-T. 
Um, do you have, the, I guess, do you have the robbuilt.com website as well? No, some guy tried to sell that to me for $20,000, but you can go to robbuiltchannel.com or robbuilt.co, um, right. or just go to, honestly, just find me on Instagram. Uh, my, my, my handle is robbuilt. And then obviously YouTube is my bread and butter. You can go to, you find me on Rob Built there, youtube.com slash Rob Built. And then if you want to get super saucy, you can go to TikTok uh, and find me at Rob Built Toe because I'm on Soul Rob Built. So, oh, I got it wrong it. there. But yeah, 1B. All right, cool, Rob. Thanks so much for being on the show. Again, hostcamp.com or just look him up anywhere on YouTube, Instagram at Rob Built, Rob Built or hostcamp dot com thanks for being on the show thanks man i wish we could have more time it. to talk it's been a pleasure let's and, do it again uh, sometime yeah bring me right, on man good talking to you see you guys everybody take care have a good one